Uh, so welcome to Chicago. I want to talk about this project, the Array of Things. How many people have heard of the Array of Things project? All right, so, so fresh audience. Nobody's heard of it. Um, but I want to also tell you why we're doing the project um, and what's gone into arriving at the design for the system, some of the design factors that we had to take into account. Um, for this workshop in particular, we have lots and lots of practical uh, experience of putting things up in a real city. Um, and so I'll talk some about that as well. And then, you know, what we hope to accomplish with the project and where it's going. <clears throat> Uh, my own background has been mostly high-performance computing for the past few decades. In the last 10 years, or 8 to 10 years, I turned my attention to trying to understand what are the challenges that major cities have across the board, whether it's transportation or social economic, uh, crime, etc., and began looking for opportunities to apply computer science, computer engineering, uh, uh, sciences to some of these challenges. And what we found was, of course, it's, it's uh, useful to measure cities and that cities don't have the kind of measurement infrastructure that they need. This is some of, not my work, some work that um, I found as I was preparing to give a, a talk to some high school kids in Nanjing that every city that you look to is trying to solve these uh, difficult issues of providing services. Um, in here, in this case in Nanjing, looking at temperatures across the city, comparing that across three different summers to uh, heat stroke death, and then figuring out on the right-hand side, using a little bit of mathematics, where are the most vulnerable populations in Nanjing, the north side in particular. If you look at Chicago, this is a map on the left of vulnerable populations, some combination of social economic factors and uh, air quality issues. Um, and so you can see dark is um, extremely vulnerable to PM 2.5 in particular, and light is less vulnerable. However, if you look at the um, actual function of the city, in this case, okay, these are vulnerable populations, but who is getting asthma? Who is, is suffering from uh, air quality issues? It doesn't really line up. Some of the uh, low vulnerability populations are actually um, uh, high concentrations of, of respiratory disease. And some of the high vulnerability, I guess there might be a pointer on here, high vulnerability ends up lower asthma rates. So just sort of looking at vulnerability, just looking at some view of the city doesn't necessarily tell you what's, what's happening. Now, if we're interested in uh, what is behind these asthma rates. Uh, now this graph, the bright red is over 20% of people in that area of the city with some form of respiratory disease. If we go in more detail, there are some neighborhoods where that number is 40 or above. And if we want to understand what's happening there, of course we can look at what sort of buildings people are in. But if we want to look at air quality on the left-hand side, you see all of the regulatory air quality stations for the entire Chicagoland area. The dark area is 600 square kilometers. That's where we are now, the city of Chicago. The broader area is about 10 times larger, uh, 2.8 million people in the dark blue, about 10 million across the whole area, and about two dozen air quality stations. And if we are interested in what's happening with air quality here, we're not going to get much help from these sensors. Furthermore, they're typically only measuring one or two things. So these yellow ones, for example, are only measuring PM 2.5. Others, uh, like the red ones, are just measuring, usually it's ozone and possibly nitrogen dioxide. And they're giving you, in some cases, a daily average for an entire region. In the better cases, they're giving you uh, an a, uh, hourly average. So we set out initially to put a sensor network throughout the city of Chicago to fill in some of these gaps. And we began five years ago talking with scientists in workshops about this size of different science communities, the, the climate science community, we would say, OK, if we could put hundreds of devices across the city of Chicago, what would they measure to help you answer the questions you're trying to answer? So that was the idea. And the array of things comes from this notion of an array telescope, a bunch of identical devices that, uh, when put together, can see farther and deeper than any uh, individual can. And then the notion of Internet of Things as the basis for it, that's how we came up with the name. But when we started talking to social scientists 
and transportation researchers, they said for the things that we want to measure, you can't go and buy an electronic sensor. Uh, transportation folks wanted to be able to look at the flow of traffic through an intersection. They wanted to look at events that aren't currently counted, like we can count the number of car collisions that happen at an intersection, but we don't have a way to count the number of times a car almost collided with someone. So how do you, uh, how do you count that sort of thing? Or if you're a social scientist, you want to know, hey, we put a park here. How many people use the park? What's the size of the group? How long do they stay? These kind of questions you have to be able to observe. And so we, at the beginning of the project, realized that we had to put some computing out there so that we could analyze images and sound. And the, the other thing that we wanted to be able to do was we're not building a smart city product. This is a research platform. And a lot of folks we talked to said, well, I'd want to go beyond just observing. I want to have these traffic lights adjust their operation based on what's happening in the intersection at that moment in time. When there are 100 people waiting to cross the road and not very much traffic, I want to have a longer walk signal. When it's icy, I want there to be a longer interval between the time that um, this way turns red and this way turns green. So in order to support that kind of research, we built a platform that was remotely programmable uh, to make available to people throughout the city of Chicago. We got a grant from the National Science Foundation. Um, I'll talk about the platform that's inside this. And by the way, um, this design came from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and some of my colleagues there. Um, and it's meant to be very conspicuous. We wanted to do this project in partnership with the residents of the city. If you look on poles in any city, you see lots of big black boxes and, and domes with cameras inside that kind of blend in. We wanted this to stand out, and we began talking to residents of the city of Chicago about it about four years ago, and sort of worked through privacy policies and other things like that. For the NSF project, we wanted to be able to do three things. One, of course, we want to measure the city in much greater spatial and temporal resolution. Two, Sensors are improving at the same sort of rate that you see with consumer electronics, and we wanted a project that would allow us to inject new technologies into the city on a regular basis. And then third, we wanted to be able to remotely program these things so that we could experiment with image processing, with sound processing, and, and uh, with other sort of functions right down on the desktop or on the, on the street corner. So, um, this part of the project, I would call the trivial part of the project. That is like a high school science project doing a sensor network like that. You guys know um, that's not particularly hard to do. This part here is a combination of design of this device um, and arrangements with the city of Chicago and scheduling. So the way that we designed this uh, housing here, this Stevenson Shield for the sensors, is we can add layers to this during manufacture, and so we can make the cavity inside taller. Its cavity inside is about you know, large enough to fit this sort of thing, and you can have a stack of, of uh, sensors inside there. Uh, second, we, we worked with the city of Chicago electricians, the, the guys that are mounting these on poles, to develop the mounting system for these so that they could swap the entire unit out in 10 or 15 minutes. And then third, um, we've scheduled the project so that we have the plan to put 500 of these across the city, but deploying them in 100 unit chunks. So back in March, we put 105, I think it was, that are up in the city now that are operating. Uh, at this moment, our factory is finishing another 150 and we'll put 100 up starting in a couple of weeks. Uh, that'll take about two months to put up. Uh, and then six months further, we'll do another 100. So in each of these 100 unit deployments, we have a chance to change the technology that's inside and even to try out new sensors that are perhaps may or may not last as long as we would like. And some of our uh, gas sensors here are electrochemical, printed electrochemical gas sensors. We don't know if they'll last six months or 18 months. Um, uh, but as we put these out at 100 at a time, uh, we can uh, change the sensors. In fact, in the, in the new units that go up, we've added the uh, particulate matter sensors. Only a few of them had the, the first 100 had those. In the next 100 that go up, uh, all of them have a PM1, uh, PM2.5, and PM10 sensor. 
Uh, we also redesigned the controller board, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, for the new, uh, be the fifth generation of that controller board. And then before we build the next 100, uh, so we build 150, 50 are going to other cities. Uh, before we do the next build in early 2019, we're gonna uh, massively upgrade the onboard Linux devices uh, and possibly go with more than we have today. And I'll, I'll talk about the detail there in a moment. So what do we measure? So we have this platform, we've configured it for urban sciences. We're, we've got these sensors uh, inside, in some cases, like with the light sensors uh, and one of the cameras, they're pointed straight up. Uh, the sensor boards are hanging in here as is the microphone. Uh, and then power supply and the brains in here, two fully programmable Linux devices, one for system control, um, the other for remotely programmed uh, machine learning. Um, a big part of this project has been this pushing of computing out to the edge. And we see the, the device that we've built here, we call Waggle, um, as a, a way to push uh, back and forth some of the functionality of, of data analytics. Lots of different things you'd want to do at the edge. Um, in some cases where, for example, we've just integrated these fairly expensive uh, synchrophasers to look at the quality of electrical power. And those things, as well as like a hyperspectral camera, are producing gigabytes per second of data. You don't want to have to pay for sending that back uh, and storing it. You want to actually analyze it right there at the edge. Um, in some cases, if we want to make a quick decision at an intersection, you would actually don't want to wait until you get an answer back from the cloud as to what you should do. So there are a number of different reasons that we wanted to push uh, computing out to the edge. One of the big ones in a city like this is privacy and security. So our policy, for, uh, it's all on the web, our privacy policy is that we analyze images inside the device and then when we're done analyzing them, we throw them away. So we're not sending images back, we're not storing, we're not building up a surveillance library uh, uh, for the city. So that's why we want to put things at the edge, but that brought us to a sort of difficult design problem in that, um, as you know, because you use programmable computers, they're totally unreliable. If your definition of reliable is I can leave them untouched for a couple of years. They're even more unreliable if your definition of reliability is I can leave them untouched physically, but I can program them and put new experimental software on them. So how do we build a device that's remotely programmable and yet has to live uh, up on a street pole for a couple of years? Uh, and that's where we ended up doing the bulk of our design, which was in this um, edge computing controller board, what we call the Waggle Manager or Wagman. And this device does a number of things that we sort of borrowed. Some of our team has worked on the IBM Blue Gene Q and, and other high performance computing uh, platforms. So we borrowed the concept of this uh, rack controller, if you will, where this device has a bunch of uh, relays on it. So it's providing um, power to all the devices inside, including this, uh, this right here is one of the single board Linux devices that we use. Uh, the other one's actually mounted on the back side of this. Current sensors here, um, environmental sensors inside. This is actually the, the previous uh, generation here, but so that we can watch how are these things working. And we are connected to the boot pins of each of those Linux devices, so we can watch with a heartbeat monitor, are they, are they successfully booting? Um, are they booting too often? Um, and then if we find a problem, let's say somebody sends out a whole new machine learning library and tries it out and it bricks the device, we can actually rebuild it from safe mode on a separate uh, memory device. Each of the Linux devices has two physical uh, memory systems. So um, we built a bunch of these things in uh, uh, with a cheap but very reliable Atmel processor. The, the change between this version and the one that's going out right now is in the version of the 100 devices that are up on poles right now, as I mentioned, there are two Linux devices. One of them is the one that does all the security data, movement, uh, system management. The other one is the machine learning dedicated to, to remotely program uh, uh, codes. If the controller system goes belly up, we don't have any way of connecting to the device because that's what we're connecting to. So um, the new version, we actually can remotely connect to this Waggle manager board 
and therefore we've increased the resilience of the device uh, uh, more with that, uh, with that capability. So this platform then, uh, the idea was to, to build a device that can support the kind of deep learning and vision frameworks that people are already using so that it's not a heavy lift to get your stuff running on the platform. Um, open source, you can go out in GitHub and find not just the code that runs on the nodes, but the backend servers for certificate management and configuration uh, control and other things. So all uh, open source eventually the hardware as well, including that Wagman board, will be published as open source. Uh, we just haven't done that yet because we want to wait until we have one that we're actually happy with and that's been tested in the field for, for long enough. And so we'll probably be publishing the version that we have right now. So, all right, so we've built this platform. We configured it with a bunch of sensors and cameras so we could put them up throughout the city of Chicago. And as I mentioned, one of the goals was to provide um, data to people that want to study cities. And so the data part of the project is that all of it is open and free. And again, we don't save and then publish any images or sound. Those are handled within the device. But, um, and then we've worked, uh, rather than trying to build the you know, be all end all portal or whatever for, for the system, what we've been working is with other people, other groups that want to host this data. So we do have uh, a, a bulk download site that you can go and get all the data or the last week's worth or the last day's worth. Um, we have been working with the city of Chicago. We've developed in a separate project some back-end geospatial capabilities for the city's open data portal. Um, and that will eventually be hosting this data as well. I say eventually because those kind of open data portals are typically um, dealing with very small amounts of data, at least by scientific computing uh, um, uh, measures, uh, and they're dealing typically with very static data. So you can do an overlay that says, show me crimes overlaid with building permits or with noise complaints. But it's difficult to figure out in this portal what's the right way to say, okay, I want to look at crime and air quality. What's the period you want to look at? What's granularity, et cetera? So, um, for this, then we've got APIs, that way people can repurpose to their own portals or build applications. As an example, there's a science group at UChicago that has a navigation application that runs on a mobile phone that allows you to navigate through the Hyde Park neighborhood area of the city down where the university is based on the naturalness of the environment. This is a group that studies the impact of uh, natural and built environment on people's cognitive um, attention span and, and, uh, and uh, skills. And so they've got this navigation app. It's looking at things like tree cover, uh, et cetera. What they're going to do is add noise, among other things, to, to that navigation app from, from the array of things. Other folks have come to us and said, we want to do a navigation app that will let you walk through the city of Chicago along the path that has the best air quality in the last 15 minutes or today, uh, or along the path at night where there are the most pedestrians around. Uh, I mentioned before um, with the camera that we do all the analysis uh, on the box, and there are a couple of things that we're about to roll out right now. One is pedestrian count every 30 seconds. The other is uh, object count of uh, uh, bikes, trucks, cars, buses. Uh, and then the third that we're looking at is uh, how much standing waters are flooding. If you look at the 105 devices that are out there, and this might be an early one without all 105 on them, they have been deployed in groups for specific experiments, uh, science experiments or policy experiments, and you can see them grouped here. They're all identical, so they all measure the very same thing, um, but we've decided on placement based on science questions, and that's how the next 100 will go, that's how the 100 after that will go as well. And in, early on, we were asked, uh, and we had various public meetings, we were asked, well, how do you decide who gets one of these? Which neighborhoods get these and which don't? Are you just going to put them in the places where there's high crime and surveil people, or are you going to put them in only the rich people's neighborhoods? And this was our initial answer, is we're working with residents to figure out what they're concerned about. Residents in this part of the city here are very concerned about air quality. A lot of community groups that are doing their own measurement. So that was a natural, uh, a natural uh, a partnership there. 
The, the new answer is, even with the 100, it's a little hard to see with the red ones are the 100, the blue ones are the next 100. Even with just 100 up today, there's a node within two kilometers of 82% of the population, and there's a node within one kilometer of about 40% of the population. And we think that we can move that first number up to 100%, so everyone in the city of Chicago lives within two kilometers of something that's measuring air quality and noise and, and, and weather. And then we'll see how far we can get within the one kilometer, but it feels to me like looking at the map, we could probably get up to 70 to maybe 80% within one kilometer. And that's with 200 out of a planned uh, 500. So the answer now is, well, we don't have to decide. Every neighborhood will get them. So I want to quickly um, take you through a couple of science projects that are riding on top of this infrastructure, a couple that are related to transportation. Um, Chicago, you, if you've ever read any history of Chicago, and I recommend that you do, um, is uh, Chicago is a major city in part because this was a shipping, and still is, a shipping uh, uh, crossroads. If you look at a map of rail in the United States, it's a hub and spoke out of Chicago in some sense. Um, and so rail traffic through the city of Chicago is a, is a big major issue. About a billion dollars will be invested over the next, or is being invested over the next couple of years to eliminate some of the at-grade crossings where trains are coming across at the same level as, as, as vehicles. We have just recently been asked by the Illinois Department of Transportation to put some of our devices in some of these at-grade crossing and just uh, begin to gather statistics using machine learning to look at the activity at the, at the crossing. And they're interested in not just like when does the gate go down to stop traffic and when does it come back up, although those are important numbers. What they're really interested in is once the gate goes down, how long after it goes up and how long does it take for traffic to return to normal? So there's gonna be a queue of traffic on both sides and it's gonna take a while to, to drain out. Um, the second thing that they're interested in is how many times do emergency vehicles get caught in that crossing? Um, and, and with those kind of statistics, they can then start to look at the at-grade crossings around the Chicago area and say, well, this one, if we replace this one and spend $100 million or whatever it is, that's gonna have the best or biggest impact on not just the, the uh, cars uh, traffic, but also when the truck uh, trains are coming through, they also have to slow down considerably, uh, which e eats into their, um, their throughput. The second transportation related is, um, most of you probably came in from O'Hare, uh, depending on the time of day, uh, might've been easy to get downtown, it might've been harder with traffic. Um, a tip if you're going back out there uh, is take the blue line, it's cheaper and only takes about 40 minutes. Um, and you don't have to deal with traffic with the blue line, uh, the CTA train. But uh, what we are doing with the Department of Energy is putting a whole bunch of these array of things, devices in and around the airport to start looking at the flow of different kinds of vehicles, um, um, uh, the impact on uh, transportation in the area, et cetera. Uh, another area that is of interest to cities is flooding. This is a map of 2004 and the number of basement flooding reports. Um, so those are, of course, inconvenient when the basement floods, but they're also extremely expensive in terms of damaged property. Um, and, and so one of the things we, you might have seen in that other map uh, area right down here, it's called Chatham, that floods quite a bit. And so we're looking at how do you analyze images to determine whether they're standing water. And this is a pretty easy one here because the water is moving. It's not always moving. The water's moving, you can look for sinusoidal movement and say, okay, that's water and that's not water. Most of the time it's not so straightforward as that. So um, a lot of our work is supporting machine learning folks who are trying to figure out how do we detect uh, flooding. We also have um, used the platform. This is an ugly version of the box, same platform as the array of things, slightly different uh, makeup of sensors. In this case here, um, this is working in conjunction with sensors that are inside buildings and built in, in basements and moisture sensors that are out uh, in parks to get a much uh, more comprehensive idea of what's happening with flooding. Uh, uh, again, uh, sort of not flooding, but other environmental sciences. I mentioned earlier this notion of hyperspectral images. Um, 
if you, if you think about a hyperspectral image, it's, it's not just one, it's thousands of images for every frame. So the bandwidth is huge and you don't wanna send these back uh, over a network. So you wanna analyze those in place. And uh, here we have uh, some looking at different, uh, classifying different plants. Uh, here, just looking at environmental uh, out at uh, the Chicago, Chicago Botanic Garden. I uh, was talking just last week to uh, a person who's responsible for the food services at McCormick Place. McCormick Place is the largest uh, convention center in the Western Hemisphere. There's larger ones in Germany and China, but that's it. So it's like one of the, it's a huge uh, convention center. Um, they have these rooftop gardens and they were saying, well, we'd love to do what the Botanic Garden is doing and put some of your, some of your devices um, devices there like that, but we also are interested in figuring out what's going on with our bees. We have beehives and some survive the winter and others do not. So we just connected last week some of the entomologists at Argonne and the University of Chicago with the McCormick Place folks. They will no doubt come up with some unique configuration of the platform. Maybe it has more microphones, uh, maybe it has more cameras so that they can study the behavior of bees. That's the, see the advantage of this platform is that um, these guys don't have to start with a reliable remote sensing platform. They can just build on top of the one that, that we've built that's open source. And then uh, public safety, this is Soldier Field um, right here. That's where the Chicago Bears football team plays. So um, half dozen times uh, in the fall, probably maybe, I don't know, 20 times a year, 100,000 people show up there. Uh, we have just mounted four of our devices around Soldier Field as an experiment um, to try to determine if we could uh, differentiate between planes, birds, and drones. If the drones are coming in over a stadium like that, if you're, if you're in charge of security, you kind of want to know that. Um, and it turns out that it's not the shape of the device, it's not the shape of the, of the object that we're looking for. It turns out that they all three of those things, birds, planes, and, and drones have unique patterns of movement. So we don't really need to analyze in great detail the shape of the thing, we just look at its movement through the scene. Now, um, when we went to the city of Chicago six or seven years ago and started talking about, hey, could you mount hundreds of devices that we would build on street uh, poles throughout the city, one of the things that they were interested in is education. I'm not sure why this uh, uh, video is upside down, but you'll have to flip it in your mind. And so three years ago, we started this um, program. I don't know how I can turn that sound off, but it's just music. Um, we started this program with Lane Technical High School. This is a college prep high school on the north side of the city, about 4,000 students. They had just created a maker space uh, they all already had a computer science uh, program. So we, di we did this eight week curriculum now, three years in a row. Uh, it stretched to 12 weeks this, um, uh, this past spring, where we wanted kids to, f to, to learn how to start with a question. Like I have a question about what does the environment look like in terms of temperature and humidity on the weekends we're not around and we have our greenhouse or our aquaponics laboratory. Um, is the building environmentals, is it, you know, is it consistent through the weekend, nights and weekends? Uh, or are experiments getting messed up because they shut the heat off or the air conditioning off? So a question like that, uh, or another question would be, uh, there are multiple ways to get to the second floor, which stairway is most, uh, most used? Um, so they start with a question like that and then they develop a experiment plan they design a sensor device, they build it in their makerspace, that's what those, uh, those devices are that are hanging from the upside down table there. Um, then they deploy it for a couple of weeks, analyze the data and write their report. In the first year, um, we had 150 students. In the second year, we changed the requirements a little bit. One is that we um, removed the prerequisite that you had to already have taken a programming class, which had the effect of in, in, increasing the number of uh, girls in the class and increasing the number of, of kids that maybe weren't interested in computer science but might be interested in other areas of science for which sensors could be useful. Uh, we also in the second year added a requirement that 
they write up their project on hackster.io in a, in a way that someone else could re reproduce it. All their code, all their wiring diagrams, the parts list, the purpose, uh, uh, some of the data, et cetera. Then in the third year, we changed another aspect of the program, which is we said, instead of you coming up with the question, why don't we ask some other organization to tell us what's important to them? So we partnered with the Chicago Cubs baseball uh, organization. They had just, um, so we're right here, it's north of, the, uh, north of downtown here, Wrigley Field was just remodeled. Uh, it's a 40,000 person uh, vintage baseball stadium. Uh, they had also built some things around, it's kind of hard to tell here, but they built a hotel and some office space. And so with their partnership, they came and they said, the kids, well, we're interested in a couple of things. One, the comfort level at different parts of the stadium throughout games. And so there you see kids here working with the, what are essentially weather stations. The second is that, um, so the history of Wrigley Field, um, which was built over 100 years ago, um, it wasn't until the last few decades that you could have night games there. There weren't even lights. And then uh, they did a deal with the neighborhood and with the city that you could have a certain number of night games per year. And the reason is that people live around Wrigley Field. When 40,000 people come for a game, it produces some level of disruption in the neighborhood. And so noise is one of the things that, that they were concerned about. How's, what's the noise level at the stadium and as you move out from the stadium? So a second thing that the students they had a choice, they could build a sound sensor. And then the third is the, the Cubs organization said, hey, every time there's a game here, and there are like you know, 80 games a year, 40,000 people are coming in and, and, and going out of the stadium. So is there some way we could poll them uh, on their opinions of something? So the kids had a third choice, which was a, what they called a sentiment analysis box, like you probably saw in, in airports, uh, with a happy button and a sad button and so they could put a sign above it with a question and as the fans are coming in or out they can hit that uh, happy or sad button for yes or no. Uh, this is a program that we've now trained last summer we trained uh, teachers from a dozen schools in the Chicago uh, school district and so this fall we'll be expanding from one school to at least a dozen and then we're gonna uh, see if we can go beyond that. Uh, if you're particularly interested in this we would like to expand this internationally for two reasons. Uh, one, to get these kids to work with people who have grown up and live in a different culture. And two, um, as many of you probably experience, it's really different working with a team where you see them every day or every week than it is working with a team that is a ten, 10 time zones away, where they're sleeping and you're, you're awake. And so we wanna get the kids some experience in working with teams that there might be three, three on the team in Chicago and three on a team somewhere else. And I mentioned going to Nanjing earlier. That was the reason I was in Nanjing talking to high school students. So I'll, I'll close and then there'll be time for, for, for questions. Um, this is where we are today. We've gotten over 120 requests uh, to, to put in some number of these devices in other places. Um, the yellow ones are just you know early conversations or in some cases stale conversations. Um, the, the green ones, there are actually sensors or, or nodes out there. Uh, in those places and various stages of being installed. The red ones uh, we will probably be able to do before the end of this year and the blue ones early in 2019. As I mentioned, we, we're building 150 units right now. Um, 100 go in Chicago and 50 will go out to some of these red, uh, uh, red and, blue and blue dots. What differentiates the, the yellow dots from the rest is that We've learned from working with the city of Chicago and actually also from working with the city of Detroit directly that it's really a lot of interaction that's required with the city to put something in like this. And it's about 15% of my time just interacting with the city of Chicago on these projects. So you can imagine that there aren't very many cities any group could work with. So what we're looking for are research partners in those places in most most cases it's the research partner, not the city that comes to us, that will take responsibility for working with their city to do the logistics of, of buying these nodes. And so what we've got is a, a, a set of research agreements that are between the University of Chicago and these other Stanford, uh, Syracuse, UNC, et cetera. Um, and that's how we do these, these projects. This year, most of those green ones are less than 10 nodes. Um, that's intentional. We've said to people, 
just take a couple of them right now because in the spring next year, our machine learning capability on board will be improved by a factor of 20 to 50. And so a lot of these groups are looking at image and sound processing. Uh, so we said, well, wait till we upgrade the, the computing before you uh, buy more. So we'll probably put in an order for more in January or so. It's about a 60 day lead time, but there's a company in Chicago that builds these for us and we inject new boards or whatever we need as, uh, as we go on. So I'm gonna stop there and I think we have plenty of time for, for questions. Yeah, so um, two questions. Have we thought about emergency deployment? And second, in those cases, about other networks. Um, we have a number of groups that have been working with us that have said, we actually don't want to put them on poles. We want to put them on vehicles. Um, and, and that would be pretty straightforward to do. We just haven't focused on it ourselves. Uh, and one of those... Um, Scenarios, what we, we ta actually talked to the city of Chicago emergency management, as you've probably seen, they have these things that are like a small trailer that they roll out and a telescoping thing goes up that has lights or antennas. You see these on vans for, for news uh, companies. So that would be a, a, an easy, and, uh, easy method to do this. Our devices are, I should have brought one with me, they're, they're not super big, they're about you know, this, this big, they're 14 by 14 inches and about nine inches deep or wide. Um, and they weigh maybe, they weigh less than 10, probably more like six or seven kilograms. So they could go up on a pole like that. They also are pretty quick to put up if there's power there already. The installations that we're doing around the city take about two and a half hours, but about two hours of that is running power up the pole. If we were in an emergency situation, we could send the crews out and tap into the power that's already there for the signal lights. They just chose not to do that uh, just for separation of, of operations. So we have thought about it. Or we're you know, interested in working with people that want to try, try that. Then the second question about networking, because we're doing our networking from a Linux platform, as long as there's Linux drivers available, we can use any kind of network uh, um, we've already done these devices with power over Ethernet, we've done with Ethernet, we've done with Wi-Fi, uh, and then uh, cellular. We haven't done a mesh version, mostly because the, the mesh networks that we find, unless you're really close, the bandwidth isn't quite as high as we'd like it to be. Um, but we've got a partnership, for example, with the power company here, the uh, Exelon owns the ComEd power company, and, um, and we're, we're looking at making it work with their mesh network that they use for uh, smart, smart grid. So, so the answer is that, you know, whatever network is available uh, with a, a Linux drivers, we can, we can make it talk because we're just doing straight IP. So in Chicago, our communication partner is AT&T. So we have this... Um, agreement with them about the bandwidth of these hundred and, and uh, we, we, we were able to bundle that with their large contract with the University of Chicago. We go into other cities in the US by default, we're just putting the AT&T SIM cards in them. Our research agreements with other groups, it's a turnkey system and we manage all that. So we just leave the AT&T SIM cards in at, that are put in the factory. When we go to some of these other places, um, you know, probably the first one will be Melbourne. Um, then we're going to have to have a different cell carrier. Um, so with the guys in Melbourne, there's actually a person from CSIRO, the National Lab of Australia, who's been at Argonne working with us for the last month and will be here another month. Um, and one of the things that he's doing is working out 
does their SIM card work with our modem? Should we do a different one? Uh, so we'll build special ones for Australia. Or, you know, it's not really a special build, it's just a different modem and SIM card. That a power supply is a 50 watt power supply, and we're typically drawing maybe 20 watts. That will change uh, when we go to the next version of the machine learning uh, piece. We may need to go above 50 watts with the power supply, and we may be using more like 50 to 100 watts, depending on what we choose for the edge computing. For example, if we put in um, the new version of the Wagman, we can put in more than just two devices and it's more plug and play. So if we put in like a couple of NVIDIA chipsets and something from ARM or Intel, we could easily start to get up into the multiple tens of watts. But right now it's about 20 watts. In the city of Chicago, um, we calculated that it was around $15,000 a year for 500 of these to operate. And that wasn't even worth doing any special paperwork. So we're just being absorbed into the energy budget of the street uh, signal lights. We do, yeah, so that's a good question about uh, 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 batteries or solar, et cetera. So we do have a couple of these units that are out in grassland areas that are using solar with a battery. We elected not to do that for the ones in the city of Chicago because um, number one, we didn't want to be limited to the, to the uh, in terms of power. We, we didn't want to go, oh, we'd love to put an NVIDIA on there, but we don't have enough power from our solar uh, cells. And we also didn't want to complicate or make more ugly the installation by having the uh, installers have to put a, a solar panel up and point it and, and worry about shading and things like that. So, but we do have, for this device, we have units that are using uh, uh, renewables. Yeah, so um, in terms of mobile, there are a half dozen agencies and departments in the city of Chicago that have standing offers to us to put them on their vehicles, including boats that go up and down the, um, the river. Um, and we just, the reason we haven't done it is we just haven't gotten around to it. We're a fairly small engineering team. Um, but I think, you know, we view that as a, a, as a good idea, uh, as a way to augment the the fixed units. Uh, we also would say, I would say, in smaller cities, that might be preferable to fixed locations because you would never have an, enough to cover everything you want, so maybe you put them on your, your city buses. Our, our, um, all of our messaging protocols and, and data uh, formats, which are simple, CSV, already account for um, mobile units uh, when these things boot up, they look for a GPS. If it's there, they start. They use it. If it's not, they don't. So, mobile is pretty straightforward. Um, the second question about smaller sensors that might be in the area. One of the things that we we evaluated was: should we put these lower cost moisture or air quality or other sensors in an area? Should we have them use the array of things node as their communication hub? And we decided not to do that because there are other options that, are, um, that don't rely on backhaul from our device. We, we actually didn't, also didn't want to build a communication network as well as what we were trying to do. And so for, for the high school program and for our sensors that are going out, like the moisture and, and air quality, we've been using a, um, an IoT platform called, uh, from a company called Particle that's an Arduino-compatible 
uh, chipset that's got also a variety of different, you can like Wi-Fi, uh, 3G, LTE, mesh. So we use those, and what we've done is we've got the smaller ones that are now cheap and plentiful, using those talking up to the particle commercial cloud, and then we put on the back end of that cloud a way to pull the data into our back end. And because, let's say we have a sensor that's just doing temperature, humidity, and um, uh, uh, PM 2.5. So we build one of these, they're like $100, it's reporting its units of measure every however many seconds with the same format as the bigger ones do, and they mix together in the back. The, the other um, question that's sort of related to that that we've gotten from people is, did we want to put um, location, location beacons or other things on our devices so that people could use them for navigate? And we decided not to do that either because if you're using a a device that cares about location, it's also probably got its own internet connection. So, you know, and that would also have sufficient uh, location capability. So a lot of these things we could do, but we didn't do because there's a better solution out there already. What kind of data is open and free? Let's see if I can go back. If you go, there's an array of things site is like, it's just arrayofthings.org. And there's a, a bunch of different items there. But one of them is the map and the data. I'm gonna go back to the image that has. So this is, there's also a table that says what's the status of all of these data. Uh, so let's see, all of these things are out there right now. We've been publishing them for a couple of months. Uh, the caveat is that these two, vibration and sound pressure, we've been experimenting with different algorithms to translate the three, readings of an accelerometer into vibration. The one we're using right now but not yet publishing is like a 2000 hertz sampling and a Fourier transform to figure out vibration. And what's holding us up on that is that we wanna work with people who care about vibration and publish in uh, units that make sense to them um, rather than just some unitless vibration. So. So that right now, uh, vibration is, uh, it's just three, three forces. So all you can tell right now from the data that's out there is that the mass of the Earth has remained fairly constant over the next six, last six months, right? And that the pole hasn't fall, fallen over because it's just an accelerometer. Uh, sound pressure we get, and we publish, the sound pressure in 10 different octaves. But we also want to do some work there to, we've been working with uh, Arup Engineering and the School of the Arts Institute of Chicago has sound experts to go out and calibrate these devices uh, from sound pressure into decibels. And then we wanna go beyond decibels and say, um, is there a noise event, uh, like a siren going by, uh, or a truck going by, or crowd noises? So there's a lot of work yet to be done here. And this is another advantage to the edge computing is um, we can just reprogram those and. These here, uh, as I mentioned before, there are only a couple of devices today that has a particulate uh, matter. Um, the ones we put out in a few weeks will all have that, so we'll start publishing more of that. And then these seven gases, the printed electrochemical sensors, we are publishing the raw sensor readings, but there's a quadratic equation that you have to go through that has coefficients for the individual sensor as well as, in some cases, temperature and humidity. And we're finalizing those uh, formulas to republish all of that data with not just the reading from the sensor in nanoamperes, but um, with the parts per million uh, values as well. So that's a month or two away. And then all of these, uh, well, I already mentioned the audio. All of these, we have experimental versions of flooding, uh, traffic flow, including pedestrian flow. It will not be until we upgrade the computing that we can start to get into the 
safety or use patterns really. Cloud cover we also can do, can do right now. So in the next month or two, the data streams will start to have these, and the pedestrian flow will be like carbon monoxide this level, number of pedestrians this, and each line of CSV has got the node ID, which maps to a location with metadata. It's got a bunch of metadata about the board that the sensor's on and the exact sensor, uh, and then it's got the raw reading uh, and then the translated reading. Um, it's going to vary for each of these. For some things like temperature, it's not going to make a huge difference. Uh, we don't know uh, it, at different times during the day what happens with the microclimate as the ceiling goes up or down, and so ozone is going to change and other things. We don't yet know the sensitivity in the vertical to those. Uh, we've got a couple of discussions that we're hoping that will pan out in the next few months to put devices up tall buildings to get some vertical measurements. And there are a few tall buildings here that we've been talking to the, uh, the building managers. Uh, noise is probably somewhat different 20 feet up than it is down on the surface, but not as different as you might imagine. It's just fairly noisy out um, in cities. So, so it depends on which one. And we are going to do an experiment in this next 100. At least 20 of them are going to go on bus shelters about eight feet off the ground. Um, and we'll probably put those near ones that are 20 feet, and that will allow us to do a number of different comparisons. Okay. Uh, All right, thank you. <laughs>